you would please take your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 24 through 29. The completion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he ends it with very, very sobering words, which are consistent with the rest of the book of Matthew and consistent with the Sermon on the Mount. Um, just a couple of quick things that I'd like to point out before uh, Mark Smith comes up and reads this text. Um, I really think that the storms that Jesus is, is pointing to in the, in, the, in the text that we all have sung, the, you know, the wise men built his house upon the rock. Wise men. Okay, that's, this is the text upon which that, that's taken from. Um, I really think that the storm that Jesus is pointing to, because of the context that we've looked at last week, because of the context several other places, is really the final judgment. What makes me even more inclined to, to believe that is because of um, its close association with Ezekiel chapter 13, especially verses 10 through 16, but basically all the first half of Ezekiel chapter 13. I think the language between Ezekiel 13, especially from 10 to 16, is so close to that of Jesus here in this passage that Jesus is making reference to that. And that passage definitely is about the end judgment, which, by the way, is the most severe storm you're ever going to face in your life. Um, you may think that having cancer is a difficult storm in your life. You may think the loss of a loved one is a difficult sto storm in your life. You may think that... Um, being financially devastated is a, is a terrific storm you have to face. You may think legal problems are a, a terrible storm that you have to face. Folks, they don't hold a candle between, b b to that of standing before the judgment seat of God if you don't have Jesus as your rock. Um, again, I, I just think that's what Jesus is pointing to here. The other thing I want to point out is that Jesus says what he does in this sermon so much so that the people, the text, uh, I forget now which word it was, amazing? Yeah, we were amazed at his teaching. The word in the Greek really means blown away, absolutely devastated. I don't know if you thought about it or not, but what we've taken basically four months to cover, Jesus said in about 45 minutes. I don't know about you all, but I've been wore out even spacing it as, as a little bit of a time that we've dissected Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I've been worn out even after having a whole week to recover after just reading a couple verses. I can't imagine sitting under the entire Sermon on the Mount, hearing what Jesus has to say, and trying to process all of this. It, for me, it would be absolutely exhausting. But the other thing it says in verse 29 is that they saw that Jesus had authority. That is huge. Authority, um, my professor said in seminary that authority is the right to impose obligation. I think that's a very fitting uh, definition of authority. The right to impose obligation. I, I'm so tempted to exercise my authority and say, would you all please stand? No, 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 don't. <laughs> Because that would be the right to impose that. I, could, I have the right to do that, but it would be a frivolous use of that authority. But it would be a helpful demonstration of the use of that authority because I have the right to ask you to stand. Some of you are looking at me like, Pastor Keith, I'm so confused. <laughs> Here's the deal. For this week, I just want the antenna to go up about the word authority. Because for the next several sermons, it's going to come up. I believe with all my heart that the Matthew, in wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount in this passage, alerts us to the fact that Jesus has authority and the right to impose obligation. And now for the next several messages we're going to look at in chapters 8 and 9 of the book of Matthew, he shows us visible demonstrations of that authority. And that ultimately what we need to do is realize, holy cow, if I don't follow Jesus, I'm being an idiot. Actually, the word is moron. A lot of you are deeply offended. Don't take it up with me. You'll find out in a little bit. That's not my word. It's Jesus' word. Listen very, very carefully as Mark Smith reads Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. 
Listen carefully. Um, I may not have the authority, but please stand for the reading of God's <laughs> word. And therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is God's word with authority. You may be seated. And Mark, you do have the authority. As a reader of uh, God's word, he has the right to ask you to stand based upon what I believe is the authority from God's word. But that's another sermon when we go to Isaiah, I'm sorry, Ezra. We won't be there for a long time. Here we go. Questions to be answered. If you want to follow along in the sermon online, or should have received it in your uh, service folder. Looks like that. Here's what I'm hoping to accomplish. The question to be answered is this. What does Jesus want us to consider as he wraps up his Sermon on the Mount? What's the big deal that the overall picture that Jesus wants us to grasp as he's wrapping up this sermon? Answer, I believe, is this. Because Jesus is the Messiah, because Jesus is the Savior of the world, because Jesus is God incarnate, he loves us far too much to see our lives built on a shaky foundation. So he asks us to consider who he is and heed his message. Folks, one of the things Matthew hopes to accomplish is get you, get you to realize how precious you are in Jesus' sight, how precious you are in God's sight, and how much he loves you and doesn't want you to suffer with the world's headaches and troubles and storms. And folks, if, you, if, if you're 20 years old and haven't faced a storm, your day's coming. If you're 40 years old and haven't faced a storm, you're either smoking or taking something that's illegal because, folks, <laughs> by now, life should have run you over somewhere along the way. In one way, fashion or another, a relationship that's been broken, a financial hardship, a medical illness, a good friend or a family member die. I mean, a D on an English exam. Boy, I'm very familiar with those. Um, life hits us like storms. And I believe Jesus is telling us that the ability to not be shaken in every storm, but especially in the ultimate storm facing the judgment of God. But I believe this passage has implications in every area of our life, in all sorts of storms that come our way. So the word for the day is heed. We need to heed Jesus' words. We need to heed what he has to say in the Sermon on the Mount. And my understanding of the word heed means more than just listen. Um, my father would come in and tell me to do something. Uh, Keith, I want you to uh, spread the, the straw on the, uh, the, where the cattle, barnyard. It wasn't called a barnyard. In the barn. And he would expect me to get that job done between the time he told me and probably supper time because that was usually a late night uh, affair when we would bed the, the cattle down for the evening. We'd spread fresh straw out for them all to lay down on it. It usually took about... Uh, 40 minutes or so, about uh, 15, 20 bales of straw, breaking them up, going among the cattle, spreading it all out, and making sure that I not only listened to, but obeyed what my father had to tell me. Because <clears throat> as my father, he had the right to impose obligations. He had the authority to tell me what to do. Parents, you have the authority to tell your children what to do. Now, my parents taught me well, and I think I carried a lot of that onto our children, is that as they get older, you impose less and less of that authority until finally you let go completely when they're married because they're establishing a new authority system. 
That is straight from the God's Word. We're going to talk about that a lot the next two weeks. So if you hate the idea of authority, you can either come and learn, which would be the wise thing to do, heeding Jesus' words, or you can ignore the service, and we'll be cleaning you up later in about 15 years when your life is a wreck. And authority structures is one of the misunderstood things in 21st century America. That's chapters 8 and 9. Right now, you need to understand that the God of the universe has put in our lap the Sermon on the Mount and said, listen, I want you to build your lives on a rock where you're, you will never be shaken, but you need to listen. And that's true of authority. We'll take a look at that too. Authority can't protect you if you get outside of its authority. I'm an American citizen. The United States will protect me while I'm here. But folks, if I go into Syria and start waving an American flag in the ISIS camp, I am now outside of the American authority and I'm taking my life in my hands, probably very, very shortly in my hands will I live. As long as we heed the authority, it gives us protection. Okay, what does Jesus have to say? That's next week's message, but, but this is this week's message. What does Jesus have to want us to consider? One, to heed and obey Jesus' message is to wisely be, build your life on solid rock foundation, on a solid rock foundation. What he says in verse 24 and 25, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and it beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Jesus is wanting us to build our lives on him and he will make us sound and secure when the storm winds blow, especially the ultimate uh, storm of facing God's judgment. I grew up on a farm. I was, my f father had authority in me and imposed obligation uh, to him all the time. And whenever he saw the, star, the stars, the skies in the southwest getting dark, he would say to me or my other two brothers, Keith, you need to batten down the hatches. I knew exactly what that meant. That mean, meant to go to every barn door, make sure that it was in its little, uh, little cleats that, that would hold it secure, and a two-by-four was wedged against it, hold it against the barn, and a rock was put there in order to make sure the two-by-four didn't move. And I would go along to all the doors, make sure they were shut, all the windows, make sure they were secure. Every, any tarps that were covering straw or covering wagons, make sure they were secure. Usually it took about 45 minutes if the storm gave us that much time to batten down the hatches and get ready for the storm. I don't know if you've ever been on a farm where those barn doors, some of, some of the barn doors we had were like 12 feet wide and 15 feet tall. If they ever came away from the barn during a 40 mile an hour wind and the wind caught it, it would take it in the next county. I mean, we, we picked up many a barn doors. Not all of them are my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking the wagon and, and going down uh, Horton Road for a couple of miles trying to find our barn door because it ripped it off the, the track and just sent it hurling. And my dad was never pleased because I hadn't battened, battened down the hatches. Folks, Jesus wants you to batten down the hatches of your life. He wants you to be prepared for the storms of life so when they come, and you never know when they're going to come, they can be on you instantly. So when the storms of life come, you will not be shaken. The raging storms may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat a shelter in this time, time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Proverbs 10.25 has this to say, and I believe it goes, goes in hand in hand with what we read from Proverbs chapter 1. When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone. But... The righteous stand firm forever. That's what Jesus wants for us. We read it in our, our call to worship from Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. 
Folks, I know that sounds like pie in the sky by and by, but I'm here to tell you that if you have Jesus as your Savior, if you understand the promises of God, if you understand what he can do for you, you can go through anything and not be shaken. Yes, you'll be weeping. Yes, you'll be distraught. Yes, you'll be troubled. Yes, you'll have pain. Yes, you'll have suffering. But you don't have to come unglued. And that's a lot of what Jesus is talking about here. Holding firm. It doesn't say that the, the, the rafters won't shatter and the walls won't shake as the storm is going by. In fact, one of the things I think Jesus is talking about is what happens in the wadis of the Middle East when a rain comes. Um, in the wadis, especially as you get down to Engedi in that area near the Dead Sea, they, it's almost all rock. And I don't know what, if you know, duh, you know, what happens to water on rock. It doesn't get absorbed into the rock. It just peels off and sheds off. And so what happens in these, these wadis is that you get one or two inches of rain and the water just all of a sudden runs off the rock and goes down these wadis. Water getting as high as 15 and 20 feet high in a wall of water coming down. The only indication you have that there's any trouble coming is the rumble that's coming down as this water, a wall of water is coming towards you. And you've got about... 35, 40 seconds to get out of the way before it just takes everything in the sight. What Jesus is saying is, don't build your house there. <laughs> build it up on the rock. Don't build it in the sand that's down the bottom when everything gets washed out. Be smart. Listen to me is what he's saying. Heed what I have to say. Number two, to ignore Jesus' message is to build foolishly. Or I'd like to entertain the word moronically. To ignore Jesus' message and to build foolishly, um, build your life on a shake, to build your, to ignore Jesus' message is to foolishly build your life on a shaky foundation. This is what he says in 26 and 27. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the storm rose, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Now, why is Pastor Keith using the word moron that's so offensive? Doesn't he know that nobody used that word in the last 30 years because it's just so... Uh, talks about an idiot, just a mindless person. Well, the reason is because the Greek language uses that word. The word foolish, the Greek is the Greek word moro, which is a direct transliteration into English of moron. Oh, you're all thrilled to death to have this. <laughs> I, folks, I think it's rather appropriate for us to hear this. It's mindless to think that you're not going to have storms. It's mindless to, to know these storms are coming and not prepare for them. And the God of the universe has had an open invitation for us to heed what he has to say to give us that stability in the storms, to build upon a rock so when the storms come, we don't have to be swept away. And to ignore that is exactly what Proverbs said. That's why I chose Proverbs instead of Ezekiel for our auxiliary text. It just one of the little slap in the face kind of text that gets you to wake up and say, don't you understand what you're ignoring by not listening to these words of wisdom that I'm trying to present to you? I, I, our culture is notorious for ignoring God's word, for setting ourselves up to be swept away. There's an there's a unbelievable contradiction in cogitation. I don't know why I use that word. I want to show you this, this building. This is on, oh boy. For those of you who are Ohio State uh, fans, I... I have to apologize up front. I, I didn't mean this in a demeaning way, but this is on the campus of Ohio State University. And I don't have many good things to say about it. This is the, the Worksner um, Center for the Arts. It's Newsweek magazine several years ago called it the first deconstructionalist building. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with deconstructionalism or not, but it's basically throwing out all the rules. There's no absolute. There's no real truth. We just kind of figure things out on our own because there's no purpose nor meaning in life. And so we just kind of go on our own. It's kind of the, the 21st century mindset of how we should conduct ourselves in, in life. 
Um, Ravi Zacharias took a tour of this building. And if you're familiar with Ravi Zacharias, he's a, got a keen mind. I think he's our, the, one of the greatest apologists that we have now that uh, Chuck Colson is no longer with us. Um, he was taking a tour of this building, and the, the tour director was going on and on about how the staircases lead up to nowhere, and in fact, there's, it leads up and there's nothing but empty space. And then it has uh, picture, uh, pillars that are hanging down the wall. They look like they're supporting the, the whole structure, but there's three-foot gap from the end of the pillar to the floor. So you, you, just, you just kind of get this feeling that nothing makes sense, which is exactly what the architect was trying to do. Okay? Now, Ravi Zacharias, being the intellectual giant that he is and, and having fun with the tour guide, asks the tour guide this question. Did the architect do the same with the foundation? Is the foundation of this building just throw the rules out, nothing makes sense, we don't need to follow anything at all, because if he did, I'm out of here. Now, obviously he didn't. Otherwise, people couldn't enter the building unless it was built according to certain construction codes that was going to keep the building intact for the general public to attend it. But folks, that kind of thinking makes me mad. Here's why. Deconstructionalists, relativists, all those folks that are in that same basket are cheating. They're taking the stuff that they know they need to have in order to promote their nonsense, but they're taking it and using it even though it's directly against what they're promoting. But they have to use it, otherwise they'd make nonsense. I always get upset with people who say they're relativists or deconstructionists or they've thrown out absolutes in, 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 in entirety, and then they're upset about it. And I go, why are you upset? Nothing has any purpose. Nothing has any meaning. There's no, no, no reason to get upset. The only reason you get upset is if a justice has been undone. If there's a right that should be done and a wrong that's been done instead, and you're getting upset about it. But if there's nothing right or wrong, you just kind of sit there. Ugh. That's all you have to do. Some of you are not grasping this concept. <laughs> Folks, they're cheating. They're stealing from the Christian faith that which they know. Listen, they make long, seemingly intelligent arguments about their case. But folks, if they were real deconstructionists, if they really didn't believe in any absolutes, why would they even bother to open their mouth? Why? You stole my line. <laughs> That's why Jesus uses the word moronic. Pastor Keith, people may listen to this and they may be offended. Yes! My intention is to offend. The gospel itself is an offense. It's meant to destroy our ego and our pride. It's meant to get us to realize that in and of ourselves we're in desperate need for a Savior. But when we're left to ourselves we can come up with this kind of nonsense. And live our lives seemingly intelligent, popular, influential lives. We're not thinking. Uh, three. Jesus certainly has authority to make claims. That's what Matthew wants to make sure you understand because the next two chapters of his gospel is going to beat on this drum showing you the extent of Jesus' authority, and it is comprehensive in scope. And if Jesus has that kind of authority, we better wake up and pay attention because he has the right to impose obligations on us. When Jesus had finished these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teacher of the law. There's... I don't, I don't know how many of you have been in this situation, but I was in this when I worked for DeKalb. I'm sorry, Pioneer. I was decastling corn. And uh, one time, uh, I happened to be, at 19, I got to be foreman. I don't, still don't understand why they did that to me. Um, I was 18. Anyway, I, I got to be foreman, and this guy came up to me and said, here is, uh, 
is um, the owner of this particular property's son. He was 16 at the time. I want you to treat him like everybody else, except for the fact that one day he's going to own all of this and he's going to have your job in his hands. <laughs> that is how we should look at Jesus. Realizing that he holds the whole world in his hands. We cannot treat him like anybody else. Jesus won't allow us to treat him like anybody else. I double dog dare you to consider what he says in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Listen very, very carefully. Jesus said this. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Uh-oh, it's right. <laughs> Do you know what Jesus is implying? Jesus is implying you are going to be supremely, divinely blessed because people are persecuting you for my sake. That means Jesus is in through the back door saying he's divine to make that kind of a statement. He goes on. Six times he talks about what the law and what the tradition of the law has to say. But what does he say right after? You've heard it said that you shall not murder, but I say to you, you've heard it said that you shall not uh, commit adultery, but I say to you, You've heard it said that if you want to get a divorce, you file for a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, what is Jesus doing? He is building on and adding to the word of God a commandment that has come straight out of Scripture, you're never to do. So is Jesus just a lunatic and he's lost his mind to do this? Or is he really God and has the authority to actually do it? Jesus wants us to wake up and realize what he's doing. It gets even more uh, 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 convincing. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. I don't know if you remember from last week or not, but that word Lord is a, a word that has wide range of meaning, but can mean Jehovah, the, the, the proper name of God himself. And by doubling it, almost for sure means that. Not everyone who says to me, Jehovah, Jehovah. Listen, folks. Some of you are looking with blank stares. Either Jesus is who he said he is, the Son of God, the divine uh, incarnation of God himself come to be the Savior of the world, or he's a lunatic. C.S. Lewis is exactly right. You must make your choice. This is what Lewis says. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and call him a demon. Or you can fall at Jesus' feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any of this patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. All through the Sermon on the Mount, he's been showing his authority and he's been imposing it upon us in order for us to get to realize we need to respond to this authority because authority has the right to impose obligation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Okay, my conclusion is this. How does one become wise? A, trust God that nothing can blow you away. If God is for you, it doesn't really matter who's against you. Paul goes on to say in that same chapter of Romans chapter 8 that in Christ we are more than conquerors. John says in 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. In 1993, my uh, wife and I, my whole family was living in um, St. Cloud, Florida. And I don't remember, that was the year that Andrew came through Florida and did de heavy devastation in the south uh, part of Florida and the homestead area especially. But in 1993, um, for a while, 
Melbourne Beach and then ultimately St. Cloud, Florida were ground zero. Andrew was headed right for us. But for our sake, fortunately, about 18 hours before, it took us to turn south and went through Homestead. I never forget going through Homestead about a year later and looking out over that area and it's just completely wiped slate clean. It was unbelievable the devastation that had taken place there. I mean, you knew that there were shopping centers here. You knew that there were apartment complexes here. You knew there were houses here. It was all gone. No telephone poles, no trees, no nothing. Just like wipe the slate clean. Except for every once in a great while, there'd be one house. Just one house. I'll never forget listening to the news about two days after Andrew went through and hearing an interview um, where this reporter was interviewing one of the survivors that had stayed in this house the whole time. The interviewer said to him, Sir, I see your house is standing while all the other houses have been destroyed. Why did your house stand? This is what he said. I built this house myself. I also built it according to Florida State Building Code. When the code said two by six roof trusses, I used two by six roof trusses. I was told that a house built according to code would survive a hurricane. I did, and it did. I suppose no one else here followed the code. The God of the universe has given us a code. If we'll live by it, we need never be shaken. It may mean your death. But you know what? My understanding of death is, hey, I've got even better coming on because I'm a believer in Christ and the promises of God. But Pastor Keith, what if you get cancer? Because then cancer is a chance for me to have my faith tested, to find out whether or not how strong my faith really is. Don't you understand that no matter what comes down the pike to us, we can find encouragement and strength from it because of the promises of God? That's why Jesus makes a promise. That's why God makes a promise that if we trust in him and put our rock in him, we need never be shaken. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. I like this quote by, by DC Talk. I believe it's in your sermon online. Instead of telling God how big your storm is, why don't you tell the storm how big your God is? That is absolutely spot on, folks. I, I, I hear myself, let alone other Christians, I hear myself so many times, <laughs> this is happening to me. And I can hear my dad, even though he's no longer with us, and I can hear my mother especially, oh, Keith, buck up. <laughs> you act as if they're, you know, Martin Luther had this problem, so I, I feel like I'm in good company. You heard about the story about Martin Luther was moping around one day and just feeling sorry for himself. Oh, there's no God. I'm being chased by the prince. I'm being chased by the pope. Nobody loves me. I'm here doing all this work and nobody cares at all. And his wife, Katie, kicked him and said, yeah, I'm sorry too. God's dead. And Martin Luther looked up at Katie, his wife, and said, God's not dead, Katie. And Katie looked at him and says, well, Martin, you're living like it. I have a Katie. <laughs> Her name's Jean. <laughs> and she won't get, let me get away with it either. And I feel blessed like Martin Luther was blessed to have a wife that will not allow me to live like God's dad because he's not. D, B, don't trust yourself. There is a right that seems right to a man. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Folks, I'm, I'm at the point in my life now where I actually, um, I don't shudder and cringe at failure anymore. <laughs> it used to be just such an assault on my pride and my ego that I just couldn't stand it when I failed. But now, you know, after reading the scriptures and looking at how God uses my failures in order to draw me to himself, I actually now go, God, help me to r realize how this failure is going to 
build my life. I actually grow more in the midst of my failures than in, midst, in the midst of my successes. Because in my successes, I tend to think, huh, I did it. And the God of the universe is going, Puy, oh, hey, what, do you, what do I got to do to show this guy, I'm the one that made you do this. But my failures, I come running to the God of the universe. God, help me out. I'm in big trouble. Yeah, yeah, you're in big trouble because you're doing things your way. I, I get this from the contrast between uh, King David and King Saul. When King Saul failed, he ran away from God. When King David failed, he ran to, to God. I would encourage you, in the midst of your failures, to realize this is an opportunity for you to more and more know, don't trust yourself. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. See, until one is born again, both points A and B are impossible. We need to learn to trust God. Romans chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3 are great passages that show us the difference in the mind between the carnal mind and the mind that's guided by the Spirit. The carnal mind looks at the things of God and goes, that's foolishness, that's moronic. But the mind that's guided by the Spirit looks at the things of God and goes, wow, that is just precious as gold. And we need to have a mind that's guided by the Spirit, but it can only happen if you've been born again. Otherwise, you're going to look at the sermon, you're going to look at God's Word, you're going to look at prayer as going, oh boy, I really don't want to, I just, I feel like you better have to. My mother will yell at me if I don't do my devotions. Really? Really? Not even ever? Do you look at God's Word and go, whoa. Wow. That's sad. Unless you're born again, you won't have the perception to be able to understand the wisdom of God. And I can tell by your spirits and I can tell by the way some of you are looking at me, you have no clue what God's word has to say to you. You never will until you allow your heart to be born again. You'll never understand what Jesus did for you. You'll never appreciate the incredible sacrifice he paid for your screw-ups. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead with this illustration. Um, hopefully you'll make the connections, make the dots. Um, this is another building, uh, the one that's got the little arrow there. This is um, the City Corp Tower in New York. It was completed in 1990, uh, 1977. Um, its architect was uh, William Le Mesurier, and uh, I don't have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not, but uh, he received all sorts of awards uh, for this particular building because of its beauty, because of its functionality, because of its uh, stability, all, all these kind of things that go into an architect uh, in his design. It was completed and uh, occupied in 1977, but early on in 1978, he found out that the people that actually did the construction didn't do it according to the plans. The girders, especially from floors 10 through uh, 30, were to have been welded instead of bolted. And there's a strength problem if you bolt these girders rather than weld. The weld is a lot more secure. And so finding this information out, he did calculations very, very quickly and realized that on floor 13, there was going to be a stress problem if there was a, a, a wind in a non-perpendicular non way uh, it, a, a wind that was a certain speed was going to come, it would force the whole building to, to topple. 
And so he contacted the meteorologist and said, how often does a a wind from this particular direction at this particular speed come in New York City? And the meteorologist said, "Uh, once every 16 years. And he realized, oh my goodness, I've got to do something. He thought about suicide, but realized that was a fool's way out. He, th- he knew that if he came public with this, he was going to be humiliated. It was going to be a big lawsuit, all sorts of problems with having to redo the building. But he finally realized this has to be done because it's, it, it's ultimately going to happen that this building will crumble and collapse when that certain wind from the certain direction comes up. And so out of, a lot of it out of his own pocket, this correction was made. What happened afterward was absolutely amazing. His reputation didn't suffer as a result. It actually became enhanced because he alone had the courage to do what was right in the face of, of the whole uh, incident. And they tore the building apart in the, the section that needed to be strengthened. They welded those sections, put it all back together, and be, made it safe enough that the wind that would now topple the building only came once every 600 years. That probably will, will do it. Folks, do you understand what the God of the universe has done for you? You were taught to build your life in a certain way. God has revealed that way in two ways, through his written word and through his son. But we have not heeded the instructions the architect had for our lives. So at great expense to himself, Jesus has come in and is willing to refortify our lives if we'll allow him to. So that we can withstand not a wind that will come up only once every 600 years, but anything that comes. That's why my worship point is this. Through your obedience, worship the God of the universe who has spared no expense and has done all that is necessary to make you wise unto salvation. Please understand how vulnerable you are without Jesus as your rock. My gospel application is this. Jesus has done the work to provide us a rock-solid foundation. Our job is to die to our own life and agenda and submit to Christ and his agenda. And we're going to definitely look at that the next three or four Sundays. We need to heed what he has to say and we need to do what he's asking us to do. We need to... Realize that he's imposing upon us obligation. We need to heed that. My spiritual challenge is this. Strive to daily allow your heart and mind to be transformed from death to life by seeing God's mercy, power, wisdom, and love for you. He's done all that is necessary in order for us to have that kind of strength. And folks, I I want to tell you, there's a lot of people who are just brain dead about their need for this kind of strength. I'm always amazed when a a, a person that's in their 80s dies and their 55-year-old children are absolutely devastated, like how in the world could this ever happen? Really? Listen, I'm serious. How can you get to be 55 years of age and not understand that your parents are going to perish soon? I mean, sorry to those of you over 80, but really, you should be doing your cramming for finals. (laughs) I'm not sure when the exam is, but... (laughs) I mean, really. I've, I've done, wow, well over 200 funerals now, and about, about one every 50 or so, I'm just absolutely floored with how isolated and insulated people are that they don't think. They just, it's like this is a total surprise. Folks, it's in the paper every day, four to ten of them. Last I knew, the odds were one out of one. (laughs) Really? This is a surprise? It's like saying, well, you're breathing? (gasps) Wow! (laughs) There's one time a pastor that has been in my position, and a position that I've been several times. 
that was speaking before a, a group of people, except this particular pastor was speaking in front of a group of people in which a 40-year-old man had perished, had, had died, and was leaving a wife and children behind as well as parents. And this, uh, this family was very, very secular, very, very carnal in their uh, understanding. That became evident during the visitation. And folks, you can learn a lot about a family during a visitation. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I go when I'm doing a funeral of a, a person that I don't know. I go early to talk to them, and then I hang around just to get a feel for what kind of friends they hang around with, what kind of influence they have, to get a feel for what I need to say the next day to bring comfort and hope. So this pastor had figured out that this was a pretty carnal group that didn't understand the promises of God and didn't understand how you can remain secure and uh, stable in the promises of God, even in the midst of the, a tragedy like losing the, the life of a 40-year-old man with a wife and children. And so he got up the next day during the se- service and said to them, um, I understand that a lot of you have put your trust in money. A lot of you are looking forward to... Uh, to uh, the medical community to keep you alive and to keep you healthy. I, I understand that a lot of you are into technology and you really are fascinated by technology. So um, I'm just a simple man with a simple me- message about Jesus and, and uh, obviously you don't think that that's important. So I'll just step back and allow um, medical community and I'll allow the technological community and I'll allow the financial community to speak to this, uh, to this wife and their children and this family during their time of grief. Folks, the financial world has nothing to say to that widow. The medical community has already exhausted all of their resources, otherwise this guy wouldn't have perished. They have nothing to say to the widow. Technology is worthless the minute you're gone. Listen, folks, a lot of you invest a lot in those things. Jesus is saying, be careful. I'm the rock, he's saying. I can allow you to weather any storm that comes your way, but you must invest in me. He talked about that in chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount. Be wise. Be wise. Think about the storms that you're going to face and what do you have to lean upon to make sure that you're secure and will not be shaken in the midst of those storms. Let's pray. God, help us. We have all around us people telling us different things that we can invest in in order to, re, uh, to make it through life. But Father, there is nothing that can offer us the security that we need that comes even close to providing the stability, the security, the refuge that you offer through Jesus. Father, there are people here today for the first time in their lives realize why this whole Jesus thing is so boring. Why this whole prayer thing is so meaningless. They've been told that if they are not born again, their eyes and their hearts have not been opened up for their minds to receive the truth about who you are and what you've done. (coughs) Father, I pray that if they want to change that status, if they realize the reality that they're missing because they have not been born again, that they would change that today, that they would come to your son Jesus and ask him to come into their their lives. And Jesus, you promise that you will be willing to do that if we repent and call upon you. Father, for someone here today that realizes for the first time that they need you to be born again, I pray that they would accept you as their Savior. Father, for the rest of us, help us to realize that you have the authority to impose obligations upon our lives and that we would become more secure, more stable. Father, I believe more blessed, more supremely, divinely happy if we would learn to submit to you. Help us to do that now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.